Welcome to season four of my podcast, Between Us, Stories of Unconscious Bias. I've added the title Between Us, as I thought Stories of Unconscious Bias alone was a little too remote. My hope was that the podcast would feature honest and personal stories that raise awareness and educate. Between Us, as a main title, underlines the intimacy while reinforcing the sense of our collective involvement. Since launching it in early May 2020, the world has again changed. George Floyd died, and Black Lives Matter, which had started in 2013, has become more popular and more widely accepted. Identity politics and culture wars have deepened in the UK and the US. Meanwhile, in other countries, people are being marginalized for their religion and beliefs. The need to understand the subject of unconscious bias has taken on ever more meaning and resonance. As always, I am so grateful to all my wonderful speakers who share their often brave stories and allow us to understand the nuances of this very important subject. Thank you for listening. I'd like to introduce Jayashree Mishra. Jayashree is an author of Indian origin living in Britain. She has written eight novels published by Penguin and HarperCollins and has also written a light non-fiction account of building a writer's studio on the beach in her home state of Kerala in India. She's a postgraduate in English literature and has two diplomas from the University of London, one in broadcast journalism and the other in special education. She has worked in special education, journalism, and as a film classifier at the British Board of Film Classification. She lives in London with her husband and daughter, who is a young woman with special needs. And it's a special education bit that I am very keen to discuss and explore with Jayashree. So I'm so glad, Jayashree, that you've decided to join me to share your stories of unconscious bias. Hello, Smita. Thanks for having me. So... What do you understand by unconscious bias, Jayashree, with the, all your various different experiences? Uh, having heard a lot of your, your podcasts, actually, I think I've sort of begun to understand the whole business of unconscious bias a little bit better than I did before, I think. Um, from what I can tell, it's, it's the most deep-seated kind of instincts and the predilection that we have towards certain people, towards or against certain people or certain things that, that that's born from um, our various experiences from the time that we're literally from the time we're born <laughs> onwards, that we kind of collect and we gather as we go along, we roll along on this, on life's journey. Uh, and and many of those experiences just translate somewhere along the way without our knowing it sometimes into biases, for better or for worse. I mean, sometimes it is a bias towards something and sometimes it's a bias against something. And this yeah. took me a while to work out, actually, Smita. And I, I think no, really no, your and podcast and I, has been very useful. I agree with you, Jayashree. And I love the phrase of rolling along because I can, and we do, we, we all around the world, we kind of roll along and just, uh, uh, you know, and I'm some things, thinking like a stone gathering moss. As exactly. They down Something the hill. stick, don't they? Exactly. Yes, exactly. And I think that's a lovely analogy, and I'm visualizing that. And I'm glad you said that it's also for, for you know, for for good or for bad. You know, I love you, or I don't love you, metaphorically. Uh, and 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 you're so right. But but to tell us a little bit more about what that looks like for you, because I mean, I have the advantage of knowing you, Jayashree, but uh, certainly our listeners don't. And and you live in London. You have a husband, and you have a daughter, a young woman. You say with special needs. Tell us a little bit more about that and, and some stories perhaps you could share with us. Goodness, she's going to be a not so young woman uh, shortly. Uh, in about four days time, she's going to turn 38, Smitha. I, I can almost not believe it myself. Wow, but gosh. 38 years ago, this girl was born to me, Rohini. I will be using her name, I guess, for the purpose of the of, of telling stories. Absolutely, story. yes. If you so don't I might as well tell your listeners that her name is Rohini. She's, uh, she's, she's totally delightful in that she's a very happy, cheery sort of soul, has always been actually from, from her childhood onwards. Um, but because her, her, her chief sort of problems lie in the area of communication, and that's expressive communication, so she, she basically can understand a whole lot more or receive a whole lot more than she's able to express. So that leads to a lot of uh, frustration and a lot of 
annoyance, anger kind of building up in her sometimes. And we get a kind of pressure cooker syndrome thing going on every once in a while. We have a little eruption and Rohini has to kind of make her presence felt in the house at, at times like that. So while I have a reasonably cheery sort of person chugging around the house most of the time, uh, there are occasions when things can get really quite difficult and there's a lot of shouting and a sl slamming of doors and and because she doesn't have the language to express all the things that are going on in her mind, it, it can take a very base sort of form of, of, of anger. So, you know, it's, it's really, it's, it's like having, it's like a two-year-old having a tantrum, you know, rolling around on the floor and, and throwing things and getting really very noisy. So it's this is the the downside to it, and the upside is that she's she bears no grudges. She's she's sort of um, you know she's sort of totally innocent to to most of the things that we the rest of us have sort of you know up, up weighed down by. So she couldn't you know she's she has no no worries no cares in the world no unconscious biases and, that's for sure. And, well, I don't know. I, I don't know about that because I was trying to think very hard for the purpose of your podcast whether she might have her own little set of biases and I think there are some but I, I'm not sure I'd be able to um, explain them very well because I, I I can't really get into her head I've never in 38 years I haven't been able to completely understand what exactly what makes it tick but I she does have a few biases yeah, if you want I'm, I'm you know I'd be happy to to touch upon. <laughs> no, but let's let's talk about you though, Jayashree, and uh, an unconscious bias from your context. So yes, 38 years ago, Rohini was born to you, but but before that, and and and, and as, I mean, when she was born, and so on. Can you tell us a little bit more about your story in relation to this? Well, uh, one thing which I perhaps should tell readers who who might not have read my first book, which is very much about, which was the story of how Rohini was born to me, and what you know the, the circumstances surrounding that is that she was born uh, in my first marriage, um, which was an arranged marriage and in a very conservative, traditional kind of Kerala setup where I lived for about 10 years. And Rohini was, was born about three years into the marriage. And I left Kerala with Rohini when she was about eight. Uh, escaped is the word that I use without being too dramatic because I think it did feel a bit like an escape. I, I escaped to London where I did a course in special education and started my life, a new life at that point in time, married the man whom I'm with now, who's been a, a good step parent to Rohini. Um, and so, yeah, the, there's plenty of stories of bias that I could tell you from the first half of my life, which was biases that I felt up that I was up against. But I think you might want to take a sort of subtler look at the whole business of, of Yes, bias. exactly. Because yeah, I'm, I'm thinking of... I'm thinking of you and your story and how you look at bias yourself. Um, and for, for, for those of you listeners who would like to read Jayashree's book, it's called Ancient Promises, uh, which I've read and, and absolutely loved. And uh, written, gosh, a long time ago now, probably 20 years ago, I think. I've lost track. <laughs> well, thank so, you. But, but Jayashree, so, so if you could tell us a little bit about, about you and your unconscious biases um, in this context, that would be really helpful to start with. I think when one of the biases I definitely had, Smitha, and maybe still do, I, I almost certainly viewed disability with a mix of horror and pity and sympathy and all those things kind of mixed up somewhere into some big lump and <laughs> emotion in my head. And the reason, I think the reason for that partially was that I went to a school for a while. I was in a school in Bangalore, that's called, um, which had a special school attached to it. So, you know, we were we were in the, the regular, the normal school, if you like. And across a little sort of picket fence, we could see the special school and the, the, the children in that school kind of milling around and doing because our, our break times were around the same time. But they were kept very separate from us physically. Uh, with good reason, I'm sure. But what we used to do, and this, at this, that stage, I was about 12 or 13. So I was sort of coming into a kind of consciousness of, you know, people and differences and what one does with these kind of differences. When we used to kind of, with an air of great curiosity, and it was sort of sympathetic curiosity at that point in time, would peer over this fence because we were, we were curious about the, you know, the, 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 the people who were on the other side and what they did and what they looked like. And, and I do remember... In, in all honesty, sort of recoiling slightly at the sight of people with, you know, who were shuffling around, not looking particularly smart, 
many of whose mouths were sort of open and some would be drooling and the kind of the most negative sort of thoughts around disability i think did did kind of enter my my mind at that point and i think if someone had asked me at that point in time what one of the worst things that could happen to me you know would be i i would quite likely have said oh having a child with with special needs having a child who's who's you know who's disabled or or whatever so i my world was one which was very separate from that there was no one in my family who had special needs i didn't grow up with cousins or nieces nephews anyone who was you know a down syndrome kid who was who was grew, grew up with with us and who became one of so having been completely robbed of that experience throughout my childhood and having had the only glimpse of 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 sort of into that world was over the school fence into this this very separate kind of world next door i i think i grew up with a lot of biases myself towards or biases against people with disabilities mm. and then yeah you know along comes uh, uh, 1983 and you know i'm pregnant and i'm i'm sort of stuck in a rather unhappy marriage and an unhappy life in in kerala far away from my parents and the you know the friends i'd known and so on and having this baby who was born and i think within about 3 or 4 months it started to dawn on me that perhaps she did have special needs there were there were little indicators that that you know were fairly early on to just sort of let me know that there was going to be that there was there was going to be a lot more on my plate than i had um, bargained for so um i think coming alongside a lot of other unhappinesses in my life uh rohini for the first few years was like yet another unhappiness that i had to carry it was very difficult to find joy in in this you know actually quite a sweet baby that was born to me because she was very pretty as a as a little as a tiny one she was you know she had lovely bouncy curls and a huge big smile as she grew older and she started to walk very late so it's about about 18 months she was um toddling around and actually very you know very sweetly she was there was lots to love and adore but because i was going through a lot of other things which were pretty negative in in my life at the time i think i just didn't i didn't learn to enjoy i couldn't enjoy the the the, the things which i think i would have in another in an, in another scenario i probably would have found easier to accept and enjoy that's so that's very moving later. that is so very moving jashri uh, just to to appreciate and understand this because you know it's so easy for us to 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 talk about the the obvious one the fact that you know you looked over the picket fence in school and 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 didn't appreciate or you know would have said your worst and nightmare would be to have a a child with with disabilities uh, which of course that is what happened with you um special needs sorry is a better correct word but but what i what i was so moved by was the fact that there's so much that was going on in your life at that time and one of the things that was going on in your life at that time is you had given birth to a little girl who you had begun to acknowledge and realize has special needs now if we put that into context for all of us listeners sometimes there is so much going on in our lives three four different things going on at the same time that could be challenging us we're not able to see the beauty or the wonderfulness or the loveliness of a little bouncy 18 month old which is the example that you gave because we're drowning in all the other stuff um Absolutely. and that's and that is just so moving and i and i really want the listeners to kind of appreciate that we've been there i've been there and our listeners have been there and and are we able to stop and pause and actually challenge our instinctive unconscious biases in amongst all of this and stop and just see some bits that are actually wonderful that's what i'm hearing you say you, which i think is very moving you know what moving. changed it for me smita sorry to interrupt but you know what Please changed do. it for me was was marrying ash the guy i'm married to now he came along into rohini's life when rohini was 8 and by then she was this character so she was this tiny tubby little character with quite a sort of mind of her own and a sort of and ways about her which i hadn't realized were actually quite winning ways and she had this this ability to get to, to meet this guy who was sort of new in my life and whom i was kind of assessing and weighing up at the time and 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 sort of twist him very firmly around her little finger so she had by the age of 8 she had that much charm that she could do that but i think what i do have to do is give credit to ash 
for having i think it's because you know he's one of those you give him a couple of lemons and he'll make lemonade out of it he's he's he sort of has a fairly positive view of life generally and what happened in in this case is when he met rohini um he kind of spotted the fun aspects to her he he spotted the things that i had failed to see up to that point which was that you can you can actually have fun with a kid like this you can actually have a funny conversation if you want to put it in inverted commas with a with with a kid like this you can do things you can go to a park and run around like mad and have this huge giggling fit and fall on the grass and so you know all those things that i had failed to do because i was this young unhappy mom who was trying to escape this awful marriage and escape kerala where i felt i was so biased against where i felt people were people didn't like me they didn't like me they didn't like my daughter they didn't like you know so so the the escape that i i experienced both in terms of going to a country where the attitude to special needs was a lot more positive not everywhere not always not with everybody but at least in the world that i occupied because i was working in a special needs environment myself um was a was a positive one and then being with a guy like ash who who was suddenly teaching me that i could actually have lots of fun with a kid like roeni and begin to, i started to enjoy some aspects i i would never hand on heart i would never state that i've enjoyed every moment of 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 mothering a girl like roeni because there's so many challenges along the way but i learned to 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 sort of appreciate some of the some of the fun stuff as well so i think that that's was just a, a so lovely No I you know what I'm hearing you saying and it's just I'm laughing and smiling to myself and and visualizing um this little eight year old with her stepdad roaring around in a garden or a park uh, in in London uh, and being wonderful and and what I'm hearing is that her stepdad your partner at that time soon to be husband at that time ha didn't have your unconscious biases didn't come yeah, and it's strange isn't it <laughs> yeah well, well but it is and it isn't because that's the point you see each of us have our own stories and our narrative and bring 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 different things i'm not saying he doesn't have unconscious biases we all do every one of us will but this was yeah. not one of them looking at children this with disabilities and seeing them as yeah. lesser than was not in his narrative had never been in his narrative and he looked at this kid and and he just thought this was a cute kid and and of course instinctively whether she has special needs uh that cannot articulate enough but she was still instinctively her own cognitive abilities allowed her to understand that and take that and i think that is just yeah. fantastic because he came with no unconscious biases towards special needs and that's why they got connected and that doing that that yeah. taught you to challenge your unconscious biases which is which is a fun story <laughs> <laughs> which i i think it's it's taken my talking to you to actually figure those things out for myself because i i i i sort of knew roughly the path that my mind had taken and how things changed for me at that point in time but yeah to to that the fact that ash didn't have those unconscious biases what the reason why he didn't have them is something i'd i you would probably have to interview him for that but i think it's something to do possibly with the fact that he didn't really have experience of children at all so he's the youngest in his family he didn't really grow up with cousins he he grew up on quite a remote sort of farm in on the edges of delhi so there were no other little children around so rohini was one of his first experiences i mean he would have had a couple of girlfriends and things when he started his life out in england but no one with children so rohini was actually his first experience of hanging out with a child any child so i think he just took the fun he just grabbed at the fun aspects which you know of being with an 8 year old there's plenty of fun to be had you know in 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 playing and he's quite sporty and active so there would be a lot of running around <laughs> which were things i i probably never took the time out for because i was so busy kind of trying to sort my life out so yeah it is it it it, it his lack of bias was charming and worked well for me and infected me i think in some way in a, in a good way exactly so uh, things got better <laughs> not perfect no, but I, better no i think that's i think that's just such a delightful story really is because we can learn so much from that but so yeah so things got better so continue with your with your story so you're here now in london and your 8 year old is now 38 so some is what's 38? happening between 8 to 38 in the last 30 oh, years goodness. <laughs> well biases in plenty i think smitha because it's 
you know, despite being in England, and of course, we travel back to India frequently as well. But if I can narrate a couple of incidents from from um, my life in, in in England, and I think you, you see, there's um, upon one thing I should explain about Rohini's. Uh, one of her characteristics is that when she is interested in someone or when she thinks they're rather smart or good looking or something, she tends to fixate on said person with a very kind of piercing stare. Now, she just does it. It's one of the things that Rohini does. Um, I long, you know, sort of, I, when, the one she started doing this, and I think she must have been about 12 or 13 when she started becoming conscious of other people and their clothes and everything else, she started doing this. And in the early years, I ran into a lot of trouble with this habit of hers. And I remember very clearly one very unhappy incident on uh, at Kennington Tube Station, actually, because we lived in the area and I was taking her somewhere on the tube. Um, and she she decided there was this woman who was in the lift with us, because Kennington Tube Station has a lift. And Rohini, without my knowledge, was staring, her, fixated entirely on her. I think it's because she was quite a good looking woman. She, was this, she had the Spanish accent when she spoke. I could hear this European accent and she had lovely, you know, massive curly hair. So Rohini must have been looking at some things to do with this woman's, you know, appearance. And the, the next thing I knew was... Uh, this very angry, very aggressive voice saying to me, not, not to me, sorry, just saying loudly in the lift, what are you staring at? And I froze because by then I kind of figured that, you know, <laughs> Roini had this habit. So um, I turned to her and I realized she was glaring at Roini and Roini was kind of glaring back at her. And I decided to wade in foolishly, I think now, in retrospect, I think I shouldn't have. But I kind of, uh, I gave her an aggressive response by saying, well, she has special needs. What's your problem? Um, so aggressiveness was clearly not the best way to do because she started to yell back at Rohini and me. I don't know whether she understood what special needs was because generally since then, whenever I've mentioned the word special needs, people kind of back off usually quite hastily. They're a bit embarrassed. But she didn't. This woman, this young, very attractive woman kind of had a go, a further go at us. And I, before I knew it, we had both, we had all three of us emerged from the lift screaming this woman and I were screaming at each other. It's one of my most embarrassing <laughs> recollections, to be honest. But while we scream, were screaming at each other, Rohini obviously got terribly upset because she's, you know, the, the worst thing for her is seeing me upset. So she started to scream and wail. And there was this awful scene in the middle of the, of the, the platform where other people were kind of backing away from us in a hurry and, you know, just they couldn't figure out what was going on. And uh, the woman boarded the neck, the, you know, this compartment and I got into the next one still seething. Um, and the minute I sat down with, you know, clutching Rohini's hand, I burst into tears. And by then, Rohini had absolutely lost it. She was red in the face and screaming and kind of whacking me because she, everything was sort of my fault. I mean, I'm the only person she can take stuff out on. And the people, you know, again, as I said, people were kind of, as Londoners do, were kind of keeping a safe distance. No one was going to come up to ask me whether I needed any help. But anyway, I kind of stumbled out of the tube and made my way to wherever I had to go. And that was that. But that incident left me with this huge fear of having that whole thing. I mean, I felt so awful in retrospect. I thought there were so many other ways you could have dealt with this, you stupid woman. Why did you take the aggressive path? And since then, whenever, because this happens a lot, Rohini staring at other people, in restaurants, in on the street, in tube stations, you know, wherever. So I, I now take, either I kind of, um, anticipate what's going to happen and I'll quickly turn to whoever it is sitting next to me and say oh please don't mind my daughter she's got special needs so she tends to stare she probably thinks you're looking lovely in that coat or something you know something to kind of soften it before it even begins <laughs> or if I don't feel able to do that if I feel somebody has an unfriendly kind of appearance I might just wait for to catch their eye and then I'll say sorry special needs or something you know I kind of I tend to take a very apologetic and explanatory kind of uh, way. So the one story that I'm going to recount to you was, um, I think there's a whole lot of biases that kind of display themselves in this story it was relatively recently, about a year or two years ago. I went to the NatWest Bank out at London Bridge, which is that's my local bank. Uh, I had Rohini with me and Ash had gone to his bank next door, the HSBC. So, um, you know, we both of us, it was, there was something going on and there were queues. So we decided we'd each of us queue up and see whoever got the money first. And that would be, you know, that. So I had Roini with me and I was in the queue and I heard this very familiar 
by now very familiar uh, the words of a, a man's voice saying, so what are you staring at? So I, I, I again, as, you, as usual, I froze. I thought, how silly of me. I hadn't been concentrating. Rohini's been, obviously been staring. So I swung around to this guy who was behind me and I did my usual thing of, uh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. She's got special needs. Has she been staring at you? Um, uh, she doesn't mean to. She's got special needs. So, you know, I'm, I'm really, really sorry. And I could see immediately the look on his face. And that's usually the, the, the reaction I get. It kind of changed. His, his expression softened. He was a bit embarrassed, a bit mortified. And he kind of took a little step back and he was nodding. And I thought, oh, good. Looks like this one sorted. I've got him under control. And that, that would have been that, actually. And we would have carried on queuing and Rohini might have stared a bit more, but he wouldn't have taken offense. What I didn't realize is the young woman who was in front of me turned around. She'd heard this exchange. She turned around and she said to me, quite loudly, so the man could hear as well. She said, you don't need to apologize to him, you know. Uh, she, and she looked at Rohini and she said, I can clearly see she's got special needs. You don't need to apologize. Now, actually, very touchingly, she was taking up for me. She was, you know, she was sort of defending yes. Rohini's right to have special needs, my right to have her stand with me in the queue and all of that. So I, I didn't want, again, I was just so worried that Ro I would say something that would start upsetting Rohini, right? At this point, it was all quite friendly. Voices were neutral. So I said to her in quite a friendly tone, I said, um, you know, not everybody gets it. It's kind of not worth fighting over it or something. I kind of laughed and tried to tried to ride over that. But she wasn't having it. Her, her whatever biases that she carried within her were basically telling her that one had to fight. One had to fight for one's right to be exactly who you are or the kind of person you want to be. So she turned around and she had to go over my head to the man behind me and said something to him, uh, still defending me, defending me and Rohini. And in the meantime, in the middle of all that kerfuffle, I saw Ash at the door of the bank saying, I've got the money, let's go. So I, in, you know, I was hugely relieved. I thought, thank goodness I can get out of this mess. And I left the bank dragging Rohini along with me, who hadn't figured any of this. She didn't even know what was going on. And as I exited the bank, I looked over my shoulder and found the two of them were shouting at each other, this young woman and oh, that dear. man. Hmm. <laughs> and I was actually quite amused. In retrospect, you know, I sort of, I walked out and I told Ash the whole story and I said, you wouldn't, you'd never guess what happened just now. There were those two people back there fighting over me and Rohini and explained the incident to him. So, but later, actually, in all honesty, having heard some of your podcasts and trying to figure out the business of unconscious bias, I thought to myself, there were so many biases at work in that one little incident. There was yes, me there who was biased yes, against the idea of defending Rohini's right to be the way she is. I had learned that, you know, sort of passiveness, passivity is a kind of best form of defense in these matters, apologizing, being sweet and all of that. So that was my bias at work. The man, I guess, biased by assuming that staring is an act of aggression or something, never for a moment figuring out that there could be other reasons for which people look at you or stare or make eye contact. This young woman with whatever she was carrying, you know, <laughs> on her shoulders. So, yeah. It's, no, it's, it's, a, it's a great story because you've got, you, you're absolutely right. You know, if I come back to you and your pure ghastly story in the Kennington Tube Station and then, and then uh, you know, and then having that learning from that and then having that repeated. But now, what you know, because when I talk about unconscious bias, I talk about the fact that when we have a, a traumatic experience, what we try and do is not have that traumatic experience ever again. We don't want to repeat it. And so we shove it into our backpack, this is my phrase, to keep us safe. And that then yeah. becomes an unconscious bias. So you then, because of that one traumatic experience in Kennington Tube Station, you started protecting yourself from ever having that experience again, that specific experience yeah. again. And so yeah. you went, for want of a better word, completely the other way, being extremely apologetic, extremely... Uh, you know, kind and over courteous or whatever, the, maybe over is a wrong yeah. word, but, but, but you see where I'm going with this. So it's, yeah. it's gone from, from being angry to being almost conciliatory and taking responsibility and saying, it's all my fault and, and, and okay. please don't get angry and so on, because you're so petrified that the anger will come like they did with the Spanish lady. And that's really yeah. interesting. So there was your story and you're absolutely right on that. And that came because of that Kennington story. 
And then, of course, we don't know the other two people, so I'm not going to make up stories on the, their behalf. But they have no. their stories. They have their yeah. stories. And, 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 and certainly the lady in front of you has had the experience of not having her voice heard. And oh, so backing down. She, exactly. she wanted her voice heard and she wanted your voice heard. She felt yeah. for you because, again, your voice was not being heard. She felt. And so yeah. in all kindness, she was trying to support you. But of course, Absolutely. the thing is, it's, it's the attitude and the angle that every one of us takes. So it, it, these are just such a fascinating, unusual, interesting stories. And it's all, of course, under the, under the guise of, of somebody who you live with and who loves you and who you love, who has special needs. Um, and we must learn from that because like you, when you were a little girl in school looking over the picket fence, there are many, many of us who may not have the opportunity and the privilege of knowing somebody with special needs. I do because I know you, so I know Roini, but not many yeah. people do. And so, so what can you teach us about, you know, challenging unconscious biases? How do we do this? What do you do? Well, actually, Smitha, it's probably yet another bias of mine that I tend to assume that people, even close friends, even my dearest of friends, I think I tend to assume are not that interested in my stories of parenting, Roini. <laughs> so, you know, while I'm perfectly happy, I'm perfectly happy to hear stories of their sons, you know, going off to, to let's say, New York and doing a flash job or uh, someone else's daughter getting into medical school and becoming this. And I love those stories. I have not a moment's... Um, also with envy or resentment or anything like that, because I genuinely enjoy the company of, you know, my, of young people, my friends, children, and these are my surrogate children, if you like, to, to some extent. So I, I, I love those stories, but I think I know, and I, I, I'm trying to figure, figure this out for myself, but I think I do um, tend to assume that they might not be as interested in my story of some some little triumph where Rohini came out with a new word. I mean, she's 38, for God's sake, to come out with a new word at the age of 38 is a tiny bit, you know, I tend to assume would be a little bit embarrassing to 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 kind of, um, you know, announce to the world. <laughs> so, um, I, yeah, I hold back. I hold back. And I, I think um, to hear you say today on this, to hear you say, um, you know, I, it, it's a privilege to get to, to know someone with special needs, to have a direct kind of a hotline, if you like, to somebody who's mm. a parent or someone with special needs. I haven't looked at it that way. I think I tend to feel concerned. I feel like it would be burdening people. If I tell them about a bad day I've had, it's burdening them. If I tell them about a good day I've had, it could seem a bit uh, frivolous or silly. And, and ask so those I, of us listening with it. Per but I was going to say parents who are listening in on this in this podcast who have who have ha who have now have adult children like I do and who've gone through horrendous bad days with their children <laughs> and who have then called their friends and complained vociferously about the bad day that I have had because my son did X, Y, Z. But of course, you're I mean, you you think, no, 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 no one wants to know about your bad days. And I think that's actually so powerful. Um, because you see your, your true. unconscious yeah. biases, you see yourself lesser than. Whereas yeah. we are all the normal people with normal children, whatever <laughs> normal means. Yeah. Oh, gosh, and I mean, I that's just... just... I'm, I'm wrong, aren't I? But I can't seem to get out of that. <laughs> well, so I think I, I have to I... ask you more questions about every time we meet, we must discuss Romy <laughs> and less, less my children and more your daughter. <laughs> and, that's what, that's... and that's what I'm saying to all the listeners too who might have the same privileges that I do, who might know someone who has special needs, you know, ask them more. Maybe they're like Jayashree and don't want to talk about it. I don't know. But, but you know, I just find that interesting. Yeah. And really when they're little, offer more, I would say, because, you know, when, when Rini was small, when after I'd moved to England and there was no, uh, no one else to kind of help, except, you know, for Ash. If I wanted to go out somewhere with Ash, I needed to find... You couldn't just call up a childminder babysitter because you needed you need people who are kind of special who know how to deal with people with special needs, kids with special needs. So you know, if there was a friend or someone who, uh, you know, one Rohini already knew or who I was I could trust completely, that would have been so much easier than trying to locate a you know a childminder a babysitter in the city. So. Um, yeah, if you know someone, if there is, you know, within your circle, I'm saying this to your listeners, with someone in your circle who has a little, a younger child with special needs, or even actually someone who's older if they're still staying at home, is it's 
you know, worth, it's worth asking. It's worth checking. If you have, you know, just saying, if you want to evening out at some point, you know, can I do a bit of babysitting for you? I'd be happy. I'd just come with my book and, you know, turn her in for the night. And I'm sure she'd be comfortable with me. And so it's worth kind of just reaching out because I think those are the things that people feel, people like me, parents like me, feel very embarrassed by. You you wouldn't feel embarrassed if you had a, a charming, normal, talkative eight-year-old who, are, you you know, would would behave nicely to whoever else was in the house. But you do feel terribly embarrassed when you've got this rather cranky, <laughs> uh, voiceless, you know, one who doesn't, who can't explain things and who can only point and gesticulate and grunt. So it, it, the, the idea of asking someone to to help out for an evening or something, it becomes a massive kind of uh, difficulty. So, yeah, if you have, if there is no, someone here, that's, that's very think, good advice. Easily. Thank you. And I, I know I'm certainly taking it on board, as I'm sure all our listeners are. But but just to sort of, to, 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 I mean, I could keep talking forever, Jayashree, but I want to just capture before we end, the, end this, this lovely chat that we're having about you and how do you manage your own unconscious biases? Because certainly you've been so wonderfully honest and you're telling me that you're still trying to challenge and, uh, and so on, you know, all these different biases that you have, for example, not sharing your daughter's uh, achievements. Um, so what, how do you manage on a day-to-day -day basis? I think I, well, I, I, as you know, I'm a writer. So when I have, when there's something really pushing away at me or really bothering me, troubling me, I find for me, the best thing is to just sit down and write, write it, write it all up. So I have pages and pages of stuff somewhere, which I wonder whether one day it'll become a book of some sort, a manual. How about a manual of special needs parenting and you know all the stuff that goes with it? But uh, th that seems to work for me. So I, I write. Um, and apart from that, I mean, it's, I think the knowledge of having a child with special needs who's, and I say child, even though she's 38, because she's always going to need care and protection all her life. Um, and this huge fear I have of, you know, of, of her outliving me and then, you know, her not having me around to be her chief defender in life. It's another bias I have. I'm sure there'd be other people who'd, who'd help care for her very well. And she lives in a group home now with some very good uh, care workers and who've managed wonderfully in this lockdown. So I really, you know, I, I'm clearly not the only person who can look out for her. But just this, this kind of the, the whole experience of the, the worries and the anxieties that go with being a parent of a special needs child, it sits inside me, Smita, somewhere. It's like this still sad pool somewhere deep inside me, which by and large remains very tranquil and very peaceful. And then every so often, someone something comes along, like that woman in the tube in Kennington Tube Station. Something will come happen that will cast a little stone into that pool, and then there'll be these ripples that will, you know, will last for a while. But by and large, it just stays there somewhere very deep inside me. Now, my bias is, I think that I don't share that enough. I think even with my partner, even with Ash, I think I, I tend to not share it because it's a bit too kind of dark and somber and, you know, who really wants to be sort of depressed, depressing about this kind of thing. So it stays there and I cope with that quite well because I think I've, you know, I, I, I know how to deal, like I said, but through my writing or through whatever my way of reflecting on things. I manage to cope and I'm generally a reasonably, uh, you know, cheerful enough person. But um, I think I perhaps need to overcome that bias and share a little bit more. Uh, whoever, whoever those might be, different people. Uh, I've stopped. I used to have used my mother to some extent for this kind of sharing, but I've stopped because now she's old and she's got, you know, I don't want to burden her anymore. So that's that. I've stopped using uh, mum. So yeah, yeah, That's just so powerful, it friends. really is. It is so very powerful what you're saying <clears throat> and sharing. Uh, a sharing, of course, you know, is is so important, and I think we all know that, but some of us do it more than others. So it's it's, I'm just moved and touched, and and uh, I'm, I'm at a loss for words really, um, because I think we've all learned so much from what you've just said, and I think it is important for you to share more, and certainly, I know because I know you that I will certainly encourage more open conversations with you, and I think certainly the other thing that the listeners would would. Uh, take away is the idea of writing. Now, we don't have to be writers. You are. But we could just create an emotional journal. And I know research has been done. 
psychological research has been done that creating an emotional journal does help us in our emotional journey. So when we are stressed or upset, to be able to yeah. put a pen to paper or, or you know, keyboard or computer screen or however you write, it then leaves your mind and your body and it helps you deal with the emotional stuff that you've had, which I think it, is it very, does. very good advice. Ah, brilliant. Jayashree, this is just <laughs> wonderful. I could talk forever. Jayashree Mishra, <laughs> thank you so very much for sharing your stories of unconscious bias. Oh, and thank you, Smita, for all you're doing in this area of unconscious bias. I have learned so much in this past, what has it now been, a year or so since you've been doing this. I'm honored and privileged to be on this, on one of your podcasts. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you for listening to my podcast, Between Us, Stories of Unconscious Bias. I'm Smitha Tharoor. If you like this episode, please do share with a friend or colleague. It's only by sharing that more people will know of it. You can find out about previous episodes and the next ones by following me on Twitter or Instagram, at Smitha Tharoor. The next episode will be in a week's time. <laughs>